The title is part of a verse. I kind of lost track. I think it's 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10. I can remember hearing it quoted to me often in the first person, hearing people in my life that were concerned about my decision making. They would say, take heed lest ye fall. We understand the principle there. It's this idea that, oh, it's so much fun, isn't it? It it is so easy to look at everybody else's shortcomings and say things like, oh, I can't believe it. And then when we talk about how bad they are, we normally just throw in a little bit of a self-righteous statement that says, I would, I don't know how anybody could have ever done that. I would never do or say or whatever it is. And that's when we would hear the question or the challenge, take heed lest ye fall. Because that's what gets us in trouble all the time, isn't it? We think that we have answers, that we've got the whole package put together. And the truth is, we're only just a few seconds away from ruining our lives. You talk to many people, and their lives have been completely changed, in many cases ruined, by just a few seconds. I mean, just a bad decision, and then that put their direction in, in the wrong way. I tell people when they want to hear it, and I don't know, I'm assuming you will want to hear it, that there's great joy in serving the Lord. I mean, I I believe that. I've experienced that, and I know you have too. But there is also a tremendous tension. There is a tremendous, you have to be alert all the time. Paul told us to walk circumspectly. And the example of that that I think best describes what I feel, and perhaps you feel the same, is walking on a tightrope, trying to balance, trying to stay up. As quickly as your attention goes somewhere else, you could also look that way and all of a sudden fall off. We like to think that we're really quite noble, but if you read in the scriptures what it how it describes our lost nature, our natural tendencies. The truth is there is nothing noble in us. We are all just this, just this close to a complete, utter failure in our Christian experience. And indeed, it would happen more often than it does were it not for the Holy Spirit rushing in and and helping us, grabbing us by the, the shoulder or the elbow or the arm and making sure that we stay upright. In our story today, we're talking about a couple of people who made just one decision. And when they made that one decision, it changed their lives completely and forever. But let's go ahead and start with where we left off in our story, and that is the power in the early church. You'll notice that we're in Acts chapter 4, starting at verse 31, and then going through Acts chapter 5, verse 11. And uh, our notes are set up a little bit differently. My intention is to be able to get them to Aaron a little sooner in the week so that he has more time to prepare those and get them printed and ready. So off to the side, of course, you see those paper uh, lines, those uh, printed lines. And I'm asking that you interact with the scriptures. You see something, you're right there close to the passage. You can put a note, additional references, anything that might come. Because when we deal with the scriptures... We're dealing with an interactive experience. It's not just coming in and listening to the preacher, you know that. It's coming in and understanding that God desires to use this hour, this half hour, for my instruction, for, for building me up, for making me ready. So, so that, that involves you interacting. So we'll ask you to have a pen handy and be able to do that. But we're talking about the power in the early church. In fact, this is where we left off last week. We talked about the power of prayer. Paul and, I mean, uh, Peter and John had been challenged by the Sanhedrin. What are you teaching? Why are you teaching it? How can we know it's legitimate? And Peter preached a powerful sermon. He says, you know exactly who we're talking about. 
You're the ones who helped to kill him. We're talking about Jesus. You know, the one who traveled around and did miraculous things, who taught wonderful truths from God, who went to the cross unfairly, unjustly, but this was a part of God's plan because he went as the Lamb of God that he might take away our sins. These people understood all of the ramifications of that. And then he says, you're the ones who crucified him. So there's a lot of tension in the air. They've been warned, you quit preaching. And Peter says, listen, you can tell us to quit, but we cannot help it. We must tell people everywhere that Jesus is alive. And because he's alive, everything in life has changed. So when they went back, it said, after this prayer, the meeting place shook, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Then they preached the word of God with boldness. There are a lot of unique things happening during this time period. This is a transitional book, is what we like to say often, meaning it's going from this direction into another direction. This is the beginning of the church. And God will do, and during the next 30 years, a, a number of incredible things to make sure that everywhere this gospel truth is being preached, it is confirmed with incredible signs and wonders. So here they are. The place is, is shaken when they pray and the Holy Spirit visits them in another very unique and unusual way. There's power in prayer. We have a number of groups, uh, not a number, we have a, a couple of groups that get together and pray. It's always an awkward feeling. You feel like sometimes all you're doing is reading through a list. But when a crisis comes, then we know how to pray. And we get together and we, we fervently and we desperately cry out to the Lord. And things happen when Christians pray. But that, not only was there power in the prayer, but there's also, letter B, the power of purpose. The power of purpose. Notice what it says here in verse 32. All the believers were united in heart and mind, and they felt that what they owned was not their own, so they shared everything they had. We're going to talk more about how they shared and, and what the principles are for us in this day, but let's emphasize this point right here. These were, as I've already said, incredible days. And because of that, there was a sense of purpose, a sense of unity. The church was growing. It was exploding in its growth. Now, here's what probably happened, as we can imagine it would be. All of these people had come in for the Passover. And that was the time when Jesus went to the garden and ultimately went to the cross. The city, it's a large city, but the city has just... It's overflowing with visitors, Jews from all around the world, Gentiles who have become sympathetic to the cause of the Jewish people, and more importantly, believed in their God. And all of these people are everywhere, all over this city, in the streets, all the inns are full. People are making money, renting out their rooms. Families have had large groups come in and stay with them. And then things are happening and they are so unusual, they are so incredible that people just stay. I mean, how could you leave? Perhaps you were one of those there when you watched Jesus, the resurrected Christ, ascend into heaven. Perhaps you're one of those who heard him say, don't worry, I'm coming back. And maybe the people were there thinking, you know, he said he could come back anytime. Let's stay right here. He could come back tomorrow. And indeed, that's our thoughts right now. We don't know when. And those people who seek to predict when it's going to happen, they really do not know. We're told simply, make sure you're ready on every single day. Every single day. These people were so excited. 
I mean, things were happening. It was like the Super Bowl rolled up into all the other Super Bowls. Every day when Peter and, and John and the other disciples would go into the temple, there was interest and conflict and conversation. So people were just hanging around and they were hanging around and there was great unity in their hearts. They had one purpose. They wanted to be a part of what God was doing in the city of Jerusalem. Now, they didn't fully understand that Jesus had told them on two occasions, no, what I want you to do is I want you to go into Jerusalem, then to Judea, and then to Samaria, and then into the uttermost parts of the earth. It's always been God's intention that the gospel just keep going out further and farther and farther. So here we have the people all in this city, but there is great unity in heart. The power of preaching. The apostles, verse 33, the apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's blessing was upon them all. There is nothing wrong with trying to make a church service more appealing, even to use the word entertaining. There's nothing wrong with a preacher using humor on occasion or, or, or bringing in stories or current events because we want the word of God to have interest. But one thing we need to know is this. God does not bless the interesting parts. He might use them. But God has promised that he would bless his word. I was thinking of, the, of that this week. And I thought, uh, I went by and I saw somebody with a load of bricks on the side of their house, obviously getting ready for a building project. And I thought to myself, you know, there are a couple of things you could do with those bricks. You could just leave them there. I mean, some people do that. They'll bring in the building supplies and they never get around to building anything and the weeds began to grow and really the bricks began to crumble and break because all the water, I mean, they're just not, bricks are not intended to just be in a pile. But we're responsible every time we hear the word of God preached. It's as if the Lord brings to us a load of bricks. And he drops them off right in our front door and says, okay, right now, here are the, the bits of truth, God's truth that you've been given. Now, what will you build with those bricks? Will you be like the person who allows the bricks to just keep piling up in a rubble heap there in front of your house? Or will you every week start taking those bricks and with those bricks build something of significance? Something that has great use and purpose. Every time we hear the word of God, whether it's in our church or on our radio or television, we are responsible to interact with that truth. What will we do with the truth that we've been reminded of again? That we've learned perhaps for the first time. Here the people are so excited. They are learning something that nobody has understood through all the ages. That God's great plan was that his son would come to this earth and he would die for sinners. And then of all things be resurrected from the dead. What hope that gives to all of us. That if the one we followed has conquered sin, whew, amen. He has conquered the devil, amen. He has conquered death, hallelujah. The word of God. Notice what it says here. Three passages that you hear often and we repeat them often because they are so important by way of their, their truth, their principles. 
In 2 Timothy 3.16, why is the power of God demonstrated in preaching? Well, here it is. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. Here's one that you know well, Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes, and he is the one to whom we are accountable. The word of God, when we listen to it, now, we can be in a church service and never hear a word. Oh, we hear the words, but we never listen to the words of God. But if we sit and if we listen, then the word of God, because of its <clears throat> impregnated power, it's not just good advice, it's not just truth. This is God's word. And because God's word has power, when we interact with God's word as it is preached and taught, it can do incredible things in our lives. Here's another very well-known, very important passage dealing with the power of preaching. The rain and the snow come down from the heavens and stay on the ground to water the earth. They cause the grain to grow, producing seed for the farmer and bread for the hungry. It is the same with my word. I send it out and it always produces fruit. It will accomplish all I want it to and it will prosper everywhere I send it. They were living in a land where there were mountains all around them. It was a semi-arid area in many places. And yet because of the snow being up in the mountain, when the weather was just right, when the soil was warm, that snow would begin to melt and it would run down. And as it ran down, what was dry, ugly dirt became beautiful and green in color because of all of the grasses that grew and all of the wild flowers that grew. The word of God, whether it's today, tomorrow, or in three years, it will have its desired effect because it is God's word. The apostles were faithfully preaching the word of God. There's great power in that. The possessions of the early church. Now we switch a little bit and we see the eagerness of the members. When we say members, these were people who had committed to one another. They had committed to the Lord Jesus. They had committed to the preaching of the gospel. This was not an organized church yet. There were not membership roles in that sense, but you understand that they were all part of a growing family. There were no needy people among them because those who owned land or houses would sell them and bring the money to the apostles to give it to those in need. Now, a lot of people have taken this passage as well as one in Acts chapter 2, and they have promoted a communal living experience that all of us should bring everything we have and throw it into the center of the room. And then those leaders of the church should distribute that the way we want it, the uh, way they want it to go, as they believe God would want it to go. That's never the pattern that God gives to us for normal living. But there are certain situations that are unusual, perhaps even extreme. I'm guessing that if you would go down into the area of Texas, where that hurricane hit, if you would be in Puerto Rico today, if you would be in Florida where there was such devastation, you would find that there are groups of believers down there because of these incredible circumstances, they are sharing like they have never shared before because the need is like it's never been before. There are people who are a part of your Christian family and they have nowhere to stay, no place to sleep. What would you do? You would open your doors and say, come on in, we'll make it work. 
Pretty soon you might be clear out of all the good food, but you would say, listen, I've got some money in the bank. We've still got a house here. The stove is working. The electricity is working. Hey, let's have a Brazilian experience. Beans and rice every meal for the next three weeks. And if that's all you had, guess what? It would taste good, right? It would be like manna coming from heaven. These people were really excited about what was happening. The need was great because there are so many in the city. And the people respond with generosity. Now, we should be known as Christians. We're told that we should be known for our love. Everybody ought to know we're Christians by the way we love. They ought to know we are Christians by our holiness. Not that we'd never make a mistake, but that we own the mistake and we apologize, ask for the forgiveness, and then we get up the next day determined to live in a way that honors our Savior. Not only that, we should be known for our humility. Our humility. We're not arrogant, self-righteous people. Nobody wants to be around those people. The truth is, I don't like being around those people. But then we should also be known as Christians for our generosity. How quickly we give. How quick we are to respond to the needs of others. The eagerness of the people. Look what they've done. They've sold whatever they needed to to take care of the needs. But here are some guiding principles that make this giving a little more understandable and even doable. Perhaps you'll remember the words in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, 11. Give in proportion to what you have. Whatever you give is acceptable if you give it eagerly. And give according to what you have, not what you don't have. So the very first thing here is God says, do not give yourself away into the state of poverty. That's, that's not a spiritual test. It's not spiritual if you're poor. So you give into proportion to what you have. Notice what Paul said later on when he was talking about a special gift coming. He says, but I want it to be a willing gift. Not one given grudgingly. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. These people were abiding by these principles that Paul would write about some years later. They were giving in proportion to what they had and they were generous because they wanted to please the Lord, not gain the attention of people. That'll be so important here in a minute. Look at the story, though, or the example of Barnabas. For instance, verse 36, there was Joseph, the one the apostles nicknamed Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He was from the tribe of Levi and came from the island of Cyprus. He sold a field he owned and brought the money to the apostles. I think it's really neat to see that he has a nickname. We don't even know him by his name. We only call him Barnabas. Later on, he's, he is one of the traveling partners with Paul. And he was a reconciler. He was a build bridge a bridge builder, a build bridger. Yeah, that's what he was. He was a bridge builder. He was an encourager. When I was reading that, I thought, what would people call me as a nickname? What, what would I be known? Some of us might be Bruce the Grouch. Ooh, nobody wants that. Bruce the Arrogant. Ooh, nobody likes that. Growing up, I was typically Bruce the Goose. Trust me, there's nothing in that name that, that's, that's elevating. But what would people say? What, would they, what word would they use to describe us? Joseph's was encourager. The one who's right with you, he's for you all the time. So that's the example. That's the positive example. And then as often as the case, they give the negative example. Let's speak of the purity in the early church. The deception of Ananias and Sapphira. Probably wealthy people. I mean, they had money to give. Their name indicates that they were probably from an upper class. 
But here's what happened. There was a certain man named Ananias who, with his wife Sapphira, sold some property. That's good. Nothing wrong there. He brought part of the money to the apostles. That's noble. Here's the part that's important. Claiming it was the full amount. With his wife's consent, he gave the rest. And how many times have we heard and thought of this? The human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? But I, the Lord, search all hearts and examine secret motives. And that's what we're talking about here. I give all people their due reward according to what their actions deserve. Ananias and Sapphira wanted to appear to be noble and, and generous and even spiritual by giving a gift. It must have been a significant gift. God was not concerned about the amount. He was concerned about the motive. So let's go on. The discovery of Ananias and Sapphira. Then Peter, Peter said, Ananias, why have you let Satan fill your hearts? Oh, it's possible any time for all of us. And then he goes on. You lied to the Holy Spirit and you kept some of the money for yourself. The property was yours to sell or not sell as you wish. But after selling it, the money was also yours to give away. How could you do such a thing like this? You weren't lying to us, but to God. Here's a good word. Don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. So let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. And Anirus and Sapphira are the opposite of those words. They did mock God. They did try to deceive the leadership. They did try to make themselves appear to be more and better than they were. And God says, I'm not going to put up with it. Some people have asked, isn't it rather harsh what he does next? And it may be that way for us, but let's remember, none of us are in a position to judge God, number one. Number two, we see this happen all the time. Teachers are often more strict during the beginning of the year than they are later on because they want to make sure there's a certain tone established. Coaches oftentimes will be strict and demanding during the first part of the season so that they know they have the will of the team. So let's look and see what happened. The deaths of Ananias, Ananias rather, and Sapphira. As soon as Ananias heard these words, he fell to the floor and died. Everyone who heard about it was terrified. I think I would be as well. Then some young men, uh, uh, some young men got up, wrapped him in a sheet, and took him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, was this piece of property you and your husband received? Um, what was the price that you and your husband received for the land? She, she replied, that was the price, yes. And Peter said, how could the two of you even think of conspiring to test the spirit of the Lord like this? The young men who buried your husband are just outside the door and they will carry you out too. Instantly she fell to the floor and died. When the young men came in and saw that she was dead, they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear gripped the entire church and everyone else who heard what had happened. Here's a living principle, or may I say a dying principle of what Paul would speak of later when he says, listen, listen, listen. Don't miss this. Don't quench the Spirit. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. 
Be honest. Be real. Don't pretend. Don't try to make yourself look better for the approval of other people. Jesus said of the Pharisees, you know who they are. They're the ones who love the praise of men more than they love the praise of God. God starts here at the very beginning of this church and he does something that is dramatic. It's, it's extreme in our understanding. But he's saying, listen, what we are is we are real people. We're not proud and religious and arrogant and deceptive like the Sadducees and the Pharisees. No, we want your religion to be a religion of humility and truth. What a tremendous start for the church. Tremendous miracles, tremendous fear of the Lord, and they will experience tremendous power. Hey, let's pray. Father, we know that every time we read passages like this, it, it concerns all of us because none of us can sit here and say that we've never lied, we've never sought to deceive, we've never been untrue. Lord, we're guilty of that so often. And I'm so thankful that your grace and mercy is extended to us. And Lord, we don't fully understand why and how all this happened the way it did, but we get the point that we need to be real, we need to be genuine in our relationships with each other. We need to be legitimate and genuine in the way we respond to the word of God. Father, these things we know and we ask for your help in doing as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for your attention.